Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another conversation in our Vet Think Lab series. My name is Kim Fish, and I am the VP of Veterinary Strategy at Petabyte, which is the home of Rhapsody, practice management software. And I'm excited to have our first podcast of 2022. We just recently did a virtual popping the champagne as we started the new year, thinking about where we have been with our company and our products and where we plan to go in this coming year, especially Q1. We have been very busy identifying and refining our goals and our initiatives for the company and our products. And I think there's gonna be a lot of really great changes coming into our industry going forward with our PIMS, Rhapsody. So we have plans for further feature development and enhancement and making it more productive and efficient for our, our users and our coming users. And of course, there's Boop, which is our new app that came out last year. It's a client-facing app, which is integrated with Rhapsody and helps pet parents have a much more active, interactive communication with the practice. So we'll be talking about that today. And then Petabyte Analytics, which is the business analytics platform that we offer it is uh, something that can be joined with Rhapsody for a more robust analytics insight to what's happening at the practice. And it can also be used alongside other PIMs that are out there. And we can, uh, just as a differentiator, uniquely standardize the data that is in the other PIMs and bring it into our reports for a really nice normalized view of what's happening at the practices. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest today that I will be interviewing. And it's Thomas Zuccotti, who is our VP of product at Petabyte. And Thomas is going to talk about our different products that we have today and what some of these initiatives are that we have with them, where we've been, where we're going. And uh, in addition to being our VP of product, he's also a cocktail connoisseur. So we're gonna have some fun with Thomas today bringing in his insight to how we can uh, drink and be merry as we're using our veterinary products under Petabyte. So thank you, Thomas, for joining me. Sure, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, one of the things when we were looking for a VP of product and we were going through an interviewing is, you know, we had our criteria and some of the things about you really stood out, which made us so excited when you wanted to join our team. So I thought maybe you could share about your background and how you got here and how you chose to come on board. Because we know that we're really happy with all of the insight that you brought in, in that background and what it means as far as the, the difference that it's making for our teams and our products now. Yeah, um, I'd happily talk about that. And uh, I'd be curious to know why I got the job from your perspective at some point. But, <laughs> um, you know, I began my career um, Actually lied, I actually lied about my age to get my first job at Nintendo at age 15 and a half in the state of Washington. You had to be 16 or older to, to, get, the, to get a job with the hours I was going to work. So I had to lie about my age. Um, and I started, so I started in software quite young. Um, I learned my craft coming up principally through Microsoft and some kind of the 90s after college. And that's really where I, I think I learned my approach to software. Most of that time was in consumer products. I won't say exclusively, but much of it. And somewhere in the early 2000s, there was a really interesting evolution of consumer products. Um, we were, you know, back in the mid 90s, we tried to do things for what our consumer wanted with the software, but most of it was based on surveys or user testing. And we never really got a great picture of how our customers were using the products. Somewhere in the early 2000s, there was a real trend towards instrumentation and data gathering in those products. And I got really excited about that. And I gradually shifted away from these larger monolithic products I've worked on and ended up doing some web apps, some mobile apps, and enjoyed that. And that journey, kind of following customer data and kind of using it to shape what we did in the product, actually led me away from the consumer space. Um, not, I should rephrase that, let me away from the, from the consumer entertainment space. I moved sort of from Microsoft to a few other companies and most recently um, before here, uh, moved to Expedia because I really wanted to work on a very large scale data-driven. I was the head of check of the product team for checkout 
and actually more than just a product team um, for part of that time at Expedia. So I used to joke with people and they'd say, well, what do you do at Expedia? I'm like, my page takes the money. And I really enjoyed that. It was, uh, I learned a tremendous amount about, you know, a, you know, just all of the things product people do, but at a tremendous scale that I'd never had an opportunity to do at that scale. And then after that journey, I started out early in my career, kind of before Microsoft, working at several smaller companies. And I had an opportunity kind of in the middle of my career to go back to one briefly and really enjoyed that time, principally because of how freeing it is to let, you know, to kind of let you, let you kind of choose what needs to be done and go do it without the bureaucracy of a larger company. So when I decided I wanted to move on from Expedia, I really wanted to find a company that had an interesting data play that I could really use and leverage to help hone the product for the customer. I wanted it to be a smaller company. I was hoping for something 100 people or less, so I was successful there. And I wanted it to have I wanted them to have a app strategy because I'm quite passionate about apps on the iPhone and I and uh, Android phone. And uh, frankly, I was really impressed with the people I, I chatted with. Um, you know, a lot of the companies I talked with were very focused on payments and checkout, given my most recent experience was Expedia. And not that I have anything against, you know, complex credit card transaction code. I really didn't want to do it for a living for the rest of my life. So I was pretty excited uh, to come join Petabyte and uh, explore a new space. I, I I don't own an animal. I'm working to acquire a dog. I'm probably the only person in America who didn't acquire a puppy or a cat during the, the lockdown. Um, We're still working I'm, on you, Thomas. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> like, you I, get a dog I, or a cat, yeah. I, I have the dog picked out. I, I want to get a, a Nova Scotia duck toller. My, my partner and I have agreed. Um, we just haven't had an opportunity to uh, put that in motion yet. But I, 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 I promise by the next time we talk, well, I don't promise, but I expect that by the next time we talk, uh, in this forum, I will have an animal of my own. So well, very but that's good. how I got here. <laughs> so this will be our challenge for you is the next time we get together. Yeah. For a Actually, life, we're going to have a toll. Right. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like, it's like a KPI or exit criteria for the, for the quarter, Thomas to acquire a dog. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> I, Which is a great segue to KPIs and things like that, because these are the types of things you have to think through as you're coming on board, which it just to, to take a step back to what you just said, uh, you know, you have this expansive background from smaller business and startup to the really big ones. And, and to, to come into this environment where you now have this opportunity to really have a lot of control and, and management and direction of where these products are going to go. So I would imagine you have to take things like the KPIs into account, how you want to reorganize the teams and things like that. So, so maybe there's something in there that um, we can... Yeah. Just, especially around, I think there's so much great organization I have seen from you. So we can touch on some of those. Let everybody else understand what we've been up to over here. Yeah. I mean, um, well, look, um, I, it's an old kind of Seattle software phrase. I don't know where it started, but I, you know, I've only been here, I think about 120 days, roughly. Um, it's been drinking from the fire hose, right? In part because you guys, I mean, Petabyte in general, has been so, just embedded in the, the the PIMS and PA and the vet space. And I, I have to raise my hand a lot in these virtual meetings we have and say, excuse me, what's that acronym or explain that to me. So I think the first thing I've been doing really is, is, is learning. And, and one of the things, <clears throat> one of the observations I've made in my time here, really, really two things I think that have struck me. One, there are a lot of very bright, knowledgeable people about the space that have lacked some of the software skills. I don't mean coding. I mean, ability to articulate how to build a feature kind of lack those skills, epic writing, you might call it, um, who have an awful lot to give to the product. Like they're the people such as yourself, right? You, you have a lot of experience with both Rhapsody and other PIMs and you have a great deal of eagerness for improvement and insight into what would improve. And I'm, I really wanna take people like you and like Alex and some others at the company and kind of democratize the role of 
you know, how we're going to improve our products. I, I, I don't believe in the singular tech visionary generally, like there are exceptions. Like if you could be Elon Musk, please go be Elon Musk. Um, but I am not Elon Musk and certainly I'm not the Elon Musk of, you know, that software. I, my, my focus is on, you know, processes and setting goals and clear understanding of outcomes and really pushing that up, down and across the organization so that people are empowered to deliver on critical things the business or the products need. But they need not be like it has, doesn't have to be an idea that like some magical product person thought of, right? It can be an idea, frankly, that that comes from our partners and that someone here picks up and champions and works with the dev team to understand how we'd implement it and test it and design it. But that's the kind of iterative process that I think in the long builds the best software. And, and really working on a process, working on process improvements that allows that kind of iteration and gradual improvement towards a clear goal is really, you know, that's my MO in software. And it's the culture I hope to, well, for all you listening, it's the culture I hope that delivers to all of you who can see our products kind of, you know, gradually, gradually increasing and improving in functionality in a direction that is in line with what we need to do. So that's sort of my, my high level software approach. And I think this iterative process you're talking about, it helps us with having that real focus of rolling out the features. We've just rolled out eight features ahead of our deadline, right? So we're pretty excited that- Yeah, 11 uh, actually, what we, 11. We, um, <clears throat> we set a goal of having the 11 done um, by the first week of February and we'll have them all complete. Well, we'll have them all completed and into testing next week and have them all deployed the following. So. It's pretty exciting. And I think I think the real difference between these last, let's say, three or four months, and the reason we've been able to like get things moving has been, you know, clear understanding about the specific things we want to deliver, ownership of who needs to deliver those, and then execution and we go forward. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm quite proud of what we've accomplished in the recent past. Yeah, that focus really has made a difference and just the fact that one, they got done and two got done ahead of schedule, I think is really a great testament to where we're going with, with the features as we continue to evolve Rhapsody. And, and I know you and I have talked about that this is kind of an agile environment for, for making those changes as we go, because we have plans for quarter one, et cetera, going on through the, you know, the year and what do we have for our long-term goals, but there's also being flexible and being able to pivot as we need to, to make sure that we can roll out according to what our ultimate goals and initiatives are. Yeah, I mean, I wanna just flag if, I don't know if I'm spoiling any, any big reveal, but the pet the pre prescription pet food feature was one that we will we'll roll out this coming, well, I don't know when you'll all be listening to this podcast. By the time you're listening to this podcast, it'll be live. It'll be um, live. <laughs> it'll be live, yeah. Uh, and it's a kind of a funny story because it's, it's been one of those things that's been requested by, uh, frankly, a bunch of folks um, for a while, and it it never quite rose to a threshold of you know this has to be the most important thing. But the observation I think we made was this is something we can do fairly quickly, and would really unblock some pain points, quite frankly, for a whole bunch of users and. I, I'm really happy with how the company went from trying to think, you know, what are the large kind of magnum opus tasks we need to deliver to, you know, what are the 11 things we can quickly do that'll really return some value to our customers. And, and I'm, I'm very excited about that feature. Like I, I totally, I was involved kind of in its design and I, I'm, I'm very excited to hear people use it and kind of say, Oh yeah, this is something we wanted for years. And now we finally have it. So I hope that, uh, I hope that hope that that lands with the the customers. Well, I'm going to brag up the design for just a second because I really like that there's a twofold part of that feature, and that is that one we can set automation around when we want a label to be created for food and supplements, and two we can also do it on the fly. So yeah. it's really functional based on different kinds of workflows, and we don't always know when we want to write a label, a, you know, script 
food or supplements. Yeah. It's very flexible for the user. And actually, I don't know if this is, if I should go into this and please push me forward uh, to other topics if you want, but uh, another interesting anecdote I think is how we've handled the new label epic we're gonna complete at the end of the month. Basically, we've been getting a lot of feedback from a lot of different people and you know, with love and respect to y'all, you don't all agree about what should go on a drug label. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, there's, there, are, there are strong, heartfelt <laughs> arguments um, you know, it, it's sort of like the old PC versus Mac argument, like, I'm not sure if there's a right or a wrong, but I know you both believe very passionately what you want. And we've had some struggles here, uh, kind of by trying to, you know, uh, you know, split the apple, if you will. And we've finally gone to a feature, um, which should be coming out to the public, I would say the first week of February, where we're just going to give you a text dialogue. And, and if you'd like, like it'll be, don't worry anybody, it's, it's gonna be populated with what's there currently. Um, and I'm talking about the federal disclaimer on the bottom, but if you wanna add some text of your own to the label at the bottom, um, you're gonna get to do that. And, and this way, I don't have to be in the position of trying to figure out you know, what's right and best for all of you, because the answer is everyone's got a unique business and they have different needs and different states and different laws. So again, it's kind of back to that theme of, let's empower and enable and democratize those choices. And, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think designers of Rhapsody always are going to know best when we don't let's let's give the users the power to implement what they think is best and go forward. I actually think this is a really good example that you brought up because it does show some adjustments in the way that we're designing things to not put ourselves in the position of always trying to split the hairs or, or choose which side to be on but make sure that we're addressing what's in the best interest of the greater good and also giving them flexibility to make it the way that they want it to be. Yeah, I mean, you and I have talked about the soap, right? And I, I, wanna, go, I wanna go back in the Wayback Machine for a second and talk, like when Petabyte started, there was a real desire for setting a standard of care for all, you know, all patients and all clients. And there was a real, it was a series of sort of analysis and and belief that we had a system that was going to prove, you know, superior or better for client outcomes and for, you know, pet, for vet operators, et cetera. And we implemented this process that was really driven around a very, a very opinionated flow in the soap, like thou shalt start here, thou shalt do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and you shall always have a soap. And I'm not saying it's all going to change tomorrow, but we internally have been looking at, you know, how can we break up some of these decisions and let practices choose parts of the flow, maybe the order of the flow, et cetera. And I think that's going to be very important because, you know, again, clinics don't agree and that's perfectly natural. They're filled with different people doing different things. Um, but, you know, and we want to provide for some of our larger partners who really want a standard way they do it across all their clinics, we want to provide that. But for other clinics who want to do it their own way and maybe shuttle to the side some of that workflow, I think we need to allow that. And, and I'm, you know, that's a little further out. I can't really make a commitment to when we'll do that. We're just in the early stages of planning it, but I'm really excited to get to it and really sort of be able to land that feature so that we can show the long-term intent of really allowing more customization and more sort of control over that flow in the, in the product in Rhapsody actually. Yeah, and I think that this is, and maybe we can look at it as a spoiler, but it absolutely is one of our main features that we're gonna be looking at here in 2022, where we want to reduce time spent, still keep it as accurate as possible. I'm really big on the legality of medical record keeping. So still keeping the integrity around that, but thinking about different um, user workflows, different practice workflows and the difference between GP and other practice types of practices, uh, what their needs are, what could we template, what could we customize? And at the same time, still keep that data really nice and clean for the practices. So that way uh, there can be benchmarking for them and they can do comparisons and we can do um, deeper medical insights. A lot of people don't realize that this is a key differentiator in our system, but because we have embedded in there um, the diagnoses and findings, exam findings list uh, 
like from the SNOMED CT, and we have vitals and breeds and species, and we've cleaned up all of these lists and have catalogs on all of these things, appointment types, we can now draw these correlations um, among these different data points. But keeping the integrity in the SOAP at the same time while we're looking at how can we make this better? How can we do improvements? How can we do the, you know, improve the user experience? What does it look like to them? Um, definitely speed of it. So, so that is a bit of a spoiler, yeah. but it's something I think that we're really excited about is a coming uh, feature improvement that we have in our system. And and data integrity is so important. I mean, just, you know, I, I to, to, it's a PG. It's a PG podcast, so I'll say poop in, poop out, right? You, like, <laughs> if you, like if you don't, if you don't take real careful care into organization and sanitization of the of the inflow of data, you're really stuck on the back end of it. And I do, you know, I do think, I, I think, frankly, our clientele um, and, and us as well really are yet to unlock the full value, or even, frankly. A sufficient fraction of the value in that data, right? I, re I really do think that the data the practices are sitting on and collecting, and the data we can help share, kind of, with the industry, is, is going to be transformative. I don't think it's going to be transformative, you know, tomorrow or the next week or the next month. But to me, that that was a very important part of why I wanted to come to Petabyte was that data story is unlike most companies of this size and certainly the impact data can have in this space could be huge i mean i won't digress and talk to you about uh i worked in the casino industry briefly and you know you <laughs> let me let, let me tell you that, that don't put any money in a slot machine because the data like, like the analysis <laughs> they've done like i like i assure you 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 really you're, you're not going to win there. They put so much analysis into, into where machines go and how they should work and you know, what makes customers put in more money. And, and it's, 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 it's impressive and chilling all at once. Um, and I hope we can you know, bring some of that data rigor and data um, democratization uh, really to the vet space. I, I really do hope it's the, the, the legacy we leave um, over time. So, And I think that's part of what we made fundamental to everything that we've done with our products and our organization. And when other groups talk about AI and things like that, sometimes we giggle a little bit because we think we're, we're actually the ones set up for it because we're the ones standardizing. We have the potential for real machine learning and AI that comes from having standardization and very large data. That we yeah, have. yeah. I mean, and there's, there's a real cold thing, like you know, having Having, having gone through a job search recently, I got news for you. I've got magic words like machine learning and bit blockchain and uh, you know other magical phrases on my on my resume. But you know, having buzzwords isn't doesn't make you able to use them, right? Like I often joke that right. machine, I don't care if you're using machine learning or not. What's what's the, what's the outcome you're giving me? Like if machine learning, if you're just running a machine learning thing that you know three sixth graders with an Excel could, could manage. I don't really care. Like what interesting insights are you gleaning with that machine learning and what value are you returning? Like, like in our particular case, I think our most sophisticated code path of the moment is really the magic. And I, and I use that word very intentionally of looking at the chaos of the different PIMs and converting it over into a clean new format, right? Is it perfect? No, all of you, well, all of you, many of you on this podcast probably have gone through that process and we're quite open when we run into challenges there, but you know, with a hundred percent, we have gotten there and we and that means we have always been able to stand up, a, you know, a clinic on an old PIMS to a new PIMS and convert that data. And I just think that, like if you if you guys understood, maybe we do a whole podcast on kind of the the human language parsing and mapping that has to take place to try to take you know a completely chaotic data set and standardize it. It's really quite impressive. That'd actually be a great idea, but I think there'd be a lot of visualizations behind it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd, see right, we'd do like a video. Right? Yeah, we'd do like we'd, we'd do like, a, like a like a podcast with with with, with helpful video. But I think it is. Uh, I, I think it's pretty magical. So, but anyway, I've I've Great. I've pushed us very far away from uh, from from drinking for one, um, but also from uh, some of the other topics we wanted to talk about. Yeah, we're and we're we're doing fine on time. So 
I like this idea though, that, um, that we really are bringing together whatever chaos they have in their systems and putting it into a nice clean format for them. So, so that's always been there. We wanna make sure that we have the data integrity across all of the things that we're doing. We've had a lot of new features get released. We have some things coming up. We just talked about SOAP. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk about localization at all. It's another endeavor that we have. Yeah. With, I mean I mean, I mean, I mean, certainly I, uh, I can talk about that. I, I, I mean, I want to just add one last point onto the data story before we move on, which is, and I, because I, I suspect there are some people listening who say, yeah, we collect all this data, but what, what value are you returning with it? And I, and I think that is, it's a, good, it's a fair question, right? Like yep. once we get the, once we standardize your data and once we get your data kind of into Rhapsody and once we, you know, keep collecting it either through PA or through Rhapsody, I think the company is you know, at the forefront of a pivot or maybe not a pivot, an, an additional thing we're hoping to do is start to return some value to people through the use of this data. And I can't really talk about specifics right now. I can tell you we've got some interesting projects starting up, but I really do want to start returning some value from that data to both you know, people who work in practices and frankly, people who own pets. Um, you know, we, we might be able to message, you know, boop users who have great gains of seven years or more of age, and they really need certain things done. And we can see that because based on outcomes, we can see in the data. I think that is a, you know, it's, a, it's an early step. I don't want to be giving medical advice. Certainly, we're not veterinarians. But I think using some of the data we have to, to improve outcomes for customers and frankly to help practices run more efficiently is, is super interesting so yeah you have you have both parts of it and i'll just speak to the medical insights really quickly because uh because we do standardize or normalize breeds vitals diagnoses appointment types the correlations you can start creating among all those things can really reveal some great insights where people can think about like are we um targeting certain breeds properly because there's some things that you can do we we have little sidetrack, but we have wellness plans built into Rhapsody. And while we might think of that as wellness focused only, I think there's a lot of other things that you can do with it, including chronic care plans and breed plans. And being able to have these kind of insights can help a practice determine what they might want to do in that area. So just a little side note about another feature that we have, but where can you use this data? I mean, I'm really big on medical insights and you know what we're able to produce, there is something different than anybody else has. Yeah, so, totally. yep. Um, so just maybe a quick localization. comment on localization, and then we'll we'll talk about drinking with Rhapsody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, drinking with Rhapsody. I I don't advise any of you to drink while using Rhapsody or while building <laughs> Rhapsody for that matter. For that matter. Just, um, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm reminded of the uh, uh, digression. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, uh, Love Actually. Yes, I'm I'm old. There's a wonderful scene where the rock star stands up on, on a, uh, in front of the TV and says, kids, don't do drugs. Become a rock star. People will give them to you. Sorry, it's kids don't buy drugs. It's, it's like, I feel like I'm doing that right now. It's like, don't drink, but that, okay. Anyway, um, localization. So uh, to date, uh, our products have only been available in English. And when you use our products, you're not just using, you know, the interface where it says, you know, hello versus hola versus konnichiwa. Um, but you're using our catalogs and a data set underneath that is customized for the US market. And we have decided as, as a company that we need to start broadening. I don't really wanna to talk too specifically about what countries and, and places we're going in the near, although one of them will definitely be Canada. Um, <laughs> and, and that means we wanna start being able to support non-English languages in the product, you know, Spanish and French are high on the list. And also it means, um, you know, foreign date formats here in America, we do the month first, the rest of the world does not do that. Um, it confuses them when we do that. So um, metric I know is an, is an attractive option for some people. I, I personally am more comfortable in metric myself. Um, so providing that not just for our overseas clients, but uh, all those features should be available in the U.S. So if you were in a practice where you have a large, let's say, Spanish-speaking population, or maybe some of the people at the practice are more comfortable in Spanish, um, you're going to be able to 
use Rhapsody in a foreign language in the US and or use, use Rhapsody in a foreign language outside the US. So you know, the specifics are kind of coming down the pipe, um, but we are we are beginning that journey. It will not be an overnight journey, but you'll begin to see choices showing up in the interface about language and units of measure and possibly date format and time format and things like that. So that should be, it should be kind of cool. Plus, uh, I hope to get some international trips out of it if the pandemic ever ends. We'll put that one on the list for yeah, sure. For sorry, both it's us. always important. I, 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 you know, it's, I think it's very important. I spend some time in Tahiti really, really soaking up the, 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 the culture of Tahiti. I think that's the idea. We need a localized there, sure. Yes. What are they, I don't even, is it French? I don't know what they speak in Tahiti. French is the official language of Tahiti. See, I guessed right. Very, very good guess. You'd make my trip. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's segue a little bit, have a little fun. Sure given your cocktail background. Uh, so first, maybe you can give us a little lesson on how a bartender might decide on what kind of cocktail to make for somebody. Sure. Um, art to that, isn't there? Yeah, pardon me? There's an art to There, there, there is, that. and there's a really, so I'll, I'll give you a little background. Um, and feel free to edit out whatever of this is not interesting to people. But, um, you know, I grew up in a family where I was making a, uh, a dry martini for my father when I was about nine, I think. Um, um, not that I was drinking them, but I, I just grew up with a lot of sort of cocktail culture, and I always found it really kind of cool as a kid, all the like mixing and the and the stuff in the shakers. So when I went through sort of a life transition, we'll call it divorce for those of you who can't read between the lines, um, in my middle thirties, uh, one of the ways I really had some time to interact with people uh, was as a bartender. I started, I was still working um, at software companies by day, but by night I would go do, you know, five or six hour shifts at local bars in my area. And I live, I live in a part of Seattle that has some really cool cocktail bars. Um, I lived in Vancouver near some cool cocktail bars. So in fact, if you, if you use my name, there are several bars in Vancouver. It's probably worth a free drink. So give it a try. Let me know how it works out. Um, I, I, I can think of two, but I won't give them out for fear that I'm going to Cost, cost them a lot of drinks, but yeah. Um, so to, so that's, that's sort of my background. Um, to, your, to answer your question, uh, in my perfect, like if you walk into my bar, the first thing I wanna know is what do you like? If you have a cocktail you like, great, tell me a cocktail you like. I won't make it for you if I can avoid it. I'd like to make something like it. I'd like to show you something new, something different, right? So, so you know, if you like a Negroni, I might make you a Boulevardier, which is a variant of a Negroni and, and, and from there. But the really more interesting kind of trend and kind of a way of having a kind of interesting conversation is let's say either A, you don't know what you want in cocktails, which is a fair answer. Not everyone has to be big into cocktails. Um, or B, maybe you want me to invent some new cocktail for you. And so usually I say, what are you in the mood for? And people say, I don't know. And I say, are you in a smoky mood? Are you in a sultry mood? Are you, you feeling happy? You feeling sad? You feeling like sunshine? You feeling like, uh, you know, whatever. And usually I say, give me, in fact, we used to use the bar all the time. We had a jar of little cards and you could write either a phrase or a word on the, on the jar. And you could say, I want a jar cocktail, and I'd pull out two or three cards, and I'd use those cards as inspiration for the cocktail I was going to make you. Well, let's um, try that with Rhapsody here. Try that with Rhapsody. Well, I, I, I will tell you, um, there's a particular cocktail I've been thinking about for Rhapsody, and it's, it's not of my own invention, so I'm sorry, but I could, I mean, we could play that game if you'd like as well. <laughs> um, but the, it's a, so Rhapsody is, like I think of cocktails as sort of having classics and Rhapsody is sort of the core and it's the it's 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 the kind of bedrock of what we do um so I think of this kind of the classic and so I really wanted to use a classic cocktail for Rhapsody but I wanted something that had you know it was a little a, a little more than you thought when you when you, when you first when you first tried it right a little so, surprising cause, yeah because because I think of Rhapsody as like when you first look at it I won't say it looks simple, but as a piece of software, you know, to manage a vet clinic, I think it does look kind of simple compared to, say, some of the others, not all the others, 
but there's some real depth to it, right? Um, there's a lot of kind of f functionality that if you look beneath the surface, you'll find other things. So I wanted a cocktail that kind of had that same, that same taste profile. So the cocktail I'm going to recommend for those of you sitting around um, using Rhapsody. And I, and I will say, unfortunately, it's a devilishly hard cocktail to mix well. So I apologize for that. Um, but it's called the Fourth Regiment. Uh, it consists principally of one part sweet vermouth, one part rye whiskey. So that's pretty easy, right? Equal, usually about an ounce, ounce and a half, and probably is how I mix this one because you generally want a cocktail between three ounces. Now we need a dash of orange bitters. Good, one good shake of the jar, really. Don't, don't, don't be shy. One good shake. Uh, you want Peychaud's bitters and celery bitters. And for those of you who are cocktail drinkers, it's kind of a variant on a Manhattan. Um, like you'll notice it's basically Manhattan uh, with a different ratio. But because you've put three different bitters, like bitters are the, they're the like if you cook, a bit, a garlic is to cooking as bitters are to cocktails. And I like that this cocktail has three different bitters in it. You'll rarely find a cocktail that does that. And they really, as you sip it, you'll like start sweet and maybe you'll get a little bit of the rye. And then at the end, you get the celery bitters and hopefully in between you get sort of the aromatics of the Peychauds. It's a, it's a cocktail I like very much. Not every bar will mix you one, but a good bar can mix you one. And it's, 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 a, it's a really wonderful cocktail. And I think it, it just was the first cocktail I thought of when I was asked to you know, think about Rhapsody. That's where I went. Well, I think that's super fun. And when I go to my local whiskey bar over here, I'm going to ask them for a fourth regiment. Fourth <laughs> regiment. Yeah. It's, it, and again, it's, 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 it's not terribly obscure. They should be able to make it. Um, the trick is you really got to balance the bitters and that's not always easy because, you know, st stupid, okay. <laughs> stupid bartender note, as the, bar as the bitters bottle gets lower, every shake results in more bitters coming out. So you have to moderate your shake so you get an equal amount if possible. Well, that makes it more, more difficult, especially when there's three different types of bitters in there. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it's, as I said, it, it's like, I tend to think of, I tend to think of drinks as like a, on a scale of taste complexity and a scale of mixed complexity. Like I'd put a Negroni on the high taste complexity, but like one for mixed complexity, like no one can screw up a Negroni. I put a martini somewhere in the, you know, seven or eight mixed complexity level. A fourth regiment is basically a nine on the mixed complexity level. Like it is, it is, it's not that the, it's not that it has a lot of ingredients, you have to do much to them, but balancing them is key. Okay, well, I will see how it comes out and then yeah, someday give it a you shot. make me one and we'll do a comparison. <laughs> I, 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 I will happily, I will happily make you one next time you're in Seattle. Okay, that sounds like a plan. So I think that we could go on to our next product, which is sure. Boop, our client facing app that is integrated with Rhapsody. And um, poop rhymes with poop. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's supposed to be like, you know, how you boop the dog's nose. So we have a cute. Oh, is that what it is? I didn't know. Yeah, that. Like I, it's, I it. think it's a cute little name. I, I really, I, I like the name a lot, actually. I just, whenever I hear it, I go boop. It just, I don't know, it makes me, <laughs> makes me silly to hear it, I guess. But we have joked about having boop bags. <laughs> so. Oh, that is funny. Oh, we yeah. should totally do that. Yep. I think that's a good one. Nobody steal the idea. We already said it here. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I had mentioned the wellness plans before, and this is a way that we can use the integration in Rhapsody to have it translate over to Boot, because whatever we can do to help the owner understand what their pet needs, what their, uh, what their pet is on schedule with, that the doctor has made medical recommendations about, reaching out to them with the alerts to help them know like when to medicate or when to feed or if they need to weigh their pet, when they need to bring the pet in. So it's another level going way beyond what we normally think of as reminder communications. We've come a long way from reminder postcards to now having this app that can sit right on a person's smart device that they can interact with the practice with. It's not just looking to see what has been, what's going on with the pet and their medical record, but it's in an interactive environment with the practice. So. I gave a, a whole intro. I hope I didn't steal some things from you, but maybe you can. Speak no, out. no, not at all. I mean, the only thing I was going to say is scheduling, right? I mean, that that is a uh, ninety. Well, ninety percent we have that turned on and boot. But I, I, um, it, you know, it, it's it's supposed to be. Well, 
Boop going forward is going to grow. It's going to grow like a young puppy into a really mature, well-trained dog. Um, it's, it, it, you know, it can do a lot of in interesting things. I'm not saying it's not functional. You know, it's not going to pee on your carpet. I promise. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's just scratching the surface of of what we can do. And as, as Kim outlined, it's you know, it's principally a communication tool at the moment. It's it's a, it's a tool for engaging with wellness plans if your particular practice offers those. And we're expanding that functionality um, fairly dramatically in the coming year because um, we really think it is a, it's, it's kind of a win-win. It's a win for the customer and, and, and win for the pet and win for the vet, right? It's one of those things that I think everyone feels better knowing that, you know, we've got this, this, this plan aside where you're kind of like pre-committed to taking to doing the things to take care of, of, of the animal, which I think is pretty cool. And the practice has the comfort of knowing, you know, okay, we've got a pre-commitment to this work. So so that's that's principally through Boop at the moment. Um, we will be, you know, some of those data outcomes we were talking about, I think will be driven primarily through Boop um, and primarily to the, the, the client, the, the pet parent, if you will. Um, and then for the you know for the practice uh, owner or manager, um, you know we're going to expand like I said the wellness and some of those communication features, and uh, you know there'll be some other stuff coming down the pipe on Boop. I don't want to talk in too much detail. I think Boop is the Boop is the youngest of our products and probably the most I don't want to say secretive, but the one we are the most protective of where we want to go with because I think it is the uh, it's it's the prodigal child. It's, it's the one that hopefully will eclipse them all in time but uh but we've got to nurture it and you know train it and, and get it into good shape to get there so yeah and i know that at the end of the day what we want is not only to make our practices happy but also the pet parents because all of that is going to benefit the pets yeah i mean this is a this is not like again i work in the casino business i i i can't Please don't judge me, those of you out there. I'm sorry. It was a, it was a two-year mistake. What can I tell you? Um, you know, I wasn't, look, my customer was very happy, but I didn't always go home every day thinking to myself, I'd done something better for the world and I'd made, I'd made my customer, you know, you know just a, uh, frankly, healthier, if you will. And I, one of the reasons I did want to come to Petabyte is I, I you know, I, people here really do believe in making better outcomes for for pets and, and frankly supporting, make, making, making it easier for vets to help people achieve those better outcomes. And, and that's pretty neat. It's, it's for those of you who have bothered to go like click on my LinkedIn, you'll find out I worked on some video games once upon a time and some of them were not all that very nice. Um, but uh, you know, I, I tell people I've, I've killed enough Nazis and zombies in the world and I'm ready to forgive, forget and move on. And uh, I hope that joke lands with those of you who play video games. For those of you who don't, just forget I said it. But it's uh, it's really kind of neat to work in a space where our goal every day is to kind of make you know make pets' lives better, which is pretty cool. Yep, it's a whole industry impact that we're we're yeah. pretty excited to be able to stand behind. So I assume you have a cocktail you have also come up with. I, 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 I do, I do. And, and again, you'll, you'll learn that my, my cocktails come with stories and narrative. I'll, I'll try to be a little quicker, but um, so the, uh, the cocktail I want, so, you know, Boop is young, Boop is eager, Boop is probably a vodka drinker and Boop needs to learn to like a gin drink. It's, it's kind of that, it's the next step up, right? A lot of people start out drinking uh, vodka drinks because they have no flavor. Um, I won't stereotype too much, but I will say that, you know, if you walk into my bar and you ask me for a, a, a vodka and Red Bull, you're probably under 25. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but so I think, I, think of, I, and I, and I think of this next drink as something that uh, you really can, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's easy drinking. Everyone here is going to like it, and it's going to surprise you because it's a vodka drink. It's not a vodka drink. So it's um, uh, my my friends at the bar call it catnip. It's actually a variant on a an old fashioned drink called the twentieth century. So I call it the twenty first century, um, but we can call it catnip for here because it's a better it's, it's it's a better pun given that we're at a pet company. Um, it consists of one and a half ounce gin, 
three quarters ounce lemon, a half ounce Saint Germain or Saint Germain if you prefer, um, and a half ounce creme de cacao white. You shake it over ice, serve with a twist of lemon, and you're gonna get this really neat drink. I use a fresh lemon, very important. Older, older lemons are more sour. Um, you're gonna get this really neat thing. Um, the drink starts off with kind of a sweet lemon flavor. And then there's a little floral note in the middle. And then at the end, you get this like smooth chocolate. And I got to tell you, my, my, my young clientele who comes in wanting vodka drinks, they, 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 they love these. these. These go down easy. And, and they really, uh, and then you, you smile and you tell, you know, people come into the bar and they say, I want a good vodka drink. I say, great, no problem. I'll make you this. And you just tip it and you're like, oh, this is great. What's in it? I said, no, no vodka. It's a gin drink. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, it's, it's a wonderful late night cocktail also. It's good. Well, I love that what you've done is you've elevated their palate, which in parallel <laughs> is elevating the pet owner's use of apps to- Ah, look at you. Oh, I like that <laughs> tie-in. I like it. Um, it's, it's funny. I, I, when I said catnip, that's actually what we call it um, because it was very uh, popular with a certain clientele of the bar. Um, but the funny thing is that it completely escaped my mind for a second. Like I'm working at a pet company. Catnip is a perfect name for a cocktail. I know, especially for boobs. So yeah, exactly. We have a great, you had a great selection there for, uh, the cocktail for boobs. So now we can go on and talk about petabyte analytics, which is another yeah. favorite topic of mine because it gets back to data, um, I'm just going to give a little overview again about petabyte analytics and also how it relates to Rhapsody or can relate to Rhapsody. So petabyte analytics is, like I said before, it's a business analytics platform, but it can work with other PIMs so we can import the data with a, a stream so we can keep it updated with, with everything coming through the old PIMs. But we also have a version coming off of Rhapsody. So where Rhapsody has operational reports as part of its core, Rhapsody users can also upgrade to petabyte analytics. So now they can get this, this much richer uh, data platform with more kind of analytic and benchmarking reports that they can access. So it takes it to that next level. So, so both groups can benefit, other PIMs and Rhapsody can benefit from petabyte analytics. So I will let you take it from there with where we're at with petabyte analytics and some of what we want to do going forward in the future. Yeah, and, and don't tell yourself, show you, Kim, I think you know more about how petabyte analytics works uh, probably than I do. Um, it's the product I've kind of been the least involved with to date, um, in part because the principal thing we've been doing for my time here has been a massive data architecture um, migration. We've we've migrated, like as Petabyte has grown, you know, we started out with smaller data repositories and data repositories that were fine for a few practices, but as we've onboarded more practices, we've needed to, you know, employ the power of Google. So we, we've, we've migrated our Petabyte's analytics data uh, to Google BigQuery um, without, you know, without throwing a lot of three-letter acronyms at you. Um, I'll just say that it's a significant performance improvement and it offers a lot of opportunities for both, you know, smaller practices than larger practices that want to get more sophisticated with their data visualizations. Um, the other thing as part and parcel of that is we've been going through and improving some of the performance in our charts. I know, and, and by a performance, I want to be clear, I mean load time, but I also mean Act, uh, how quickly they update from the data set. So I know as part of the data migration to BigQuery, some of the charts that used to update more quickly are now updating le less quickly. And we're in a process of getting them back to that state. That was a necessary kind of technical, you know, it, was next, it was a necessary technical cost to get us to Google BigQuery. And I think in the long, it's going to be really pay off. Um, thank you all of you who've, Kind of gone this journey with us and uh, experienced some of this pain. I do apologize for that, but it's it's been a real help, and you're going to start to see the fruits of that over the next quarter, really. And then I think the other thing is, you know, I hate I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's 
it's going back to the data, right? Uh, we want to provide more useful visualizations and more interesting visualizations around more sophisticated things we can we can view. I mean, obviously, it's important that the core data work, and you know, we have been working in this last quarter to even further verify that and putting in some more checks and balances to make sure things aren't out of true. Um, and, you know, it's not always one hundred percent, but we try to we try to get on those when it isn't. And uh, you know, the path forward, I think, is very much about exploring that data set and trying to provide some incre increasingly useful visualizations. I think the other thing that we have done, and I know, Kim, you've been involved in this, is we've sort of reorganized some of our charts. Right. Um, and you know, we, for those of you who were you know, thinking it was in one place and that was another, or, or like, we, we don't want to be in the, in the habit of doing that with any regularity. This was all part of the one time big, uh, big query migration and, and thing, you know, we don't intend to change how the data set is architected in the future, et cetera. So this should be a one-time pain, I hope. And, um, you know, pass forward is really to, to work on leveraging that data into some useful business outcome. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, it may seem painful for people that don't know what's happening behind the scenes in this little interim as we're making the transition, but where we're at now, now that all the data has been migrated over and we're in the process of rebuilding all of the, the rules or queries, that, how the reports are going to come out um, in, a, in very short order, I think that people are going to be, they're going to go from Having uh, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna say is actually like a feature creep that happened to the reports where <laughs> where people kept requesting and requesting and requesting and then our pages got so loaded with all of these report requests that um, in some ways become disconnected because there's so many different things people want and and now that we've got the data in one unified place we're also having this eye to what is it that we actually need to do to clean all of this up and to get it organized both at the Rhapsody level of reports and at PA level. And some of those that are kind of unique to a Rhapsody user that also uses PA. So I want to make that distinction. <clears throat> but really thinking yeah. about what those fields should be in each of the reports and minimizing how many reports they're seeing on a page. So there's a like an intuitive flow of what they're going through when they're going through their own workflows. Like the receptionist, when they're doing daily reconciliation, should be able to very clearly and quickly do their daily reconciliation on that page. Yeah, and I was even going to call out, right, because we got a lot of asks for, oh, could I have a chart that does this or a chart that does that? Um, I don't think it's a good metaphor for this. So like, like making code do something is not necessarily mean the way you're doing it is the most efficient or effective. Like, I guess for those of you who are literary people, you know, Hemingway used to write a sentence a day and he would start with a big sentence and then slowly contract it and he'd, he'd shorten and he'd make more efficient and he'd spend hours obsessing over like what was the right adjective here he only wanted to use one right and I used to have this joke with my father he's a Hemingway fan it's like like is it a good fish no is it a clean fish yes it's a clean fish that that encompasses you know good and and, and holy and better somehow, right? So I think, I think we're going through the similar process with a lot of our petabyte charts, which is we're taking a bunch of run-on sentences that generate an outcome and really stripping them down into very short focused sentences that should generate the same, if not better outcome more efficiently. Absolutely. I think that was a great analogy for it. Because oh, good. I was, I was sitting here flogging myself for the most tortured metaphor all day. So good. I, I'm, I'm glad that landed. Thank you. My, my similar analogy is that Stephen King says, kill your babies, which means cut 10% yeah. of everything you wrote out of there. Right. <laughs> so. right. Yeah. Yeah. When I used to do, uh, I, I'm terrible whenever I have to write an important document. I'll take sentences or paragraphs that I was proud to write. And I think they communicate the point I wanted to. And I kind of copy them and paste them at the very end of the document because they're not fitting in the document. And at the end of this document, I'll usually have several paragraphs of text at the bottom that no longer have a real home. 
in the document because that's kind of like the message has changed as it go goes on. And it's always this painful moment of, but but I like this sentence so much. It really explains what's going on. Why does it have no home? But Stephen King is right. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta let him go. You gotta let him go. So let me let me mention about transition because as we're saying this, our users might have a little trouble letting go. Like what what was there because they had some of those requests, right? So there is a transitional plan for everybody. You will continue to have your old reports, but we have a new reports mode you'll be having access to, which hopefully will get you to see that there is a maybe a cleaner, easier way of doing all this. So uh, we would like to transition you without pain and enlighten you to what the report is. <laughs> I see what you did there. Nicely done, Kim. I like yeah. that. You set me up. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, petabyte analytics is definitely something I could talk more and more about because I love analytics and, and the meaning behind the reports and what it can do for practices. I also get that uh, Data doesn't always have a lot of meaning to people. They're looking at accounting stuff. What about the rest of it? And here we provide so much great data. So a little side note, we do have webinars planned for this year to help people with a training process to give people more insight as to what, what they want to do for their own workflows and what these reports are actually supposed to mean for them. So Kim means it. If, 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 you're, if you're at a trade show some, somewhere in the next year, assuming we get to go to those again, um, Buttonhole Kim, she will you know, probably over a cup. Yeah. She will talk to you for hours about plans for petabyte analytics. I know it is, it's an area, it's, it's, it's something we do that she's hyper passionate about. And certainly I have, I have really enjoyed uh, learning and talking to her about it. So if you, if you really have more questions, I'm telling you, you got, you got to, there's, there's a way you can get more answers. So what kind of drink should they make me for petabyte? Uh, of course. Well, so again, I'm, you know, language and sort of the story is very important to me. Um, I started out with all kinds of, of, you know, of cocktails that had like, you know, lots of ingredients. I wanted to do a, there's a classic uh, tiki cocktail that has like, it's called a jungle bird. And it has like this really bitter thing in it called Campari. And people always look at you funny, like they're putting what in my what? Or um, and I kind of think of, I think of Petabyte Analytics a bit like that, right? It's got everything in the kitchen sink. It's our data repository and our visualization but my, my my favorite cocktail idea for this and again this is not one of mine this is a classic um and i uh, it's actually um i believe it's invented in seattle by a guy named murray um very famous cocktail mixer in seattle a cocktail called the last word which i just thought was the appropriate name for uh, petabyte analytics so uh this is super easy to make it has one obscure uh ingredient it's all equal parts i'd recommend probably three quarters of an ounce for each but it's just gin, maraschino liquor, which is not the stuff that goes in a maraschino cherry. It's a little different. So maraschino liquor, green chartreuse, and lime juice. Shaken over ice, no garnish, serve up. It's great. Um, it sounds a lot more challenging in its ingredients than it drinks, um, although it's not a drink for entry drinkers, certainly. Um, but it is the last word. Great drink to end the night on. Um, because of its herbaceousness married with the, the lime. Uh, it's been a favorite of mine for years. In fact, uh, I believe Murray actually made it for me the first time I had one. So um, the last word cocktail, you can, it's pretty well known. I, any good bar in America will make that for you probably without looking it up. I love the name of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's, that's, that's why we're choosing it here. It's the last word. It's the, it's the truth. It's the official, right? Yeah, it's the official word in analytics and veterinary yep. data. <laughs> yep, I thought we'd like that. Yeah, so I think this is great. We have three drinks that go with our three products, but it also gave us great insight to our resident VP of product and mixologist, Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I would never put myself uh, as a mixologist, but I'll certainly pour you a drink anytime you want. I really enjoyed the conversation, Kim. Thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. And I know that um, our marketing team would love if anybody took pictures of them using our products, but maybe making a cocktail would be counted in there too to send, send over our way. We would love to be able to share them on social media. Sure. That'd be fun. I'd love to see what people turn up. <laughs> um, but thank you all for so much for joining us today. Thank you, Thomas. This was really great. I always have fun talking with you. And, and I know that we've got some great plans for, for the coming year and then some. Great. Well, thanks again and thank everybody for listening and uh, until next time, ciao.